Howdy folks, Kevin here. Today I want to do something a little bit different than I've normally done on my channel, and that is to go through an article and just kind of uh, read through what I found was interesting in the article and then kind of give my feedback and then open it up for y'all in the comments to uh, give your feedback on what you think. So for this one, we're going to be looking at an article on shift left testing, and this is on dev.2, which is a great uh, and great developer blogging site where any developer can submit uh, their articles, and I've submitted a few on there, and uh, share them with the developer world, and I think it's a really great place, um, really focused on quality content that, uh, but quality content and a great community. So anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about shift left testing. So I'll be kind of skimming through this and going through some of the items that I highlighted. Um, I'm not going to read the entire article, but I will read parts of it here and there. So it basically intros what shift left testing shift left testing is, and it's uh, the idea behind it is to reduce defects earlier and more often so that they are easier to fix, less costly, and less stressful on developers. That's the goal of shift left testing. Uh, let's get into what it actually is. So normally, testing enters the picture at the end of the pipeline or simply put at the extreme right side of development. So you have your software development lifecycle here, phase one, gather requirements, do a feasibility study. This is like uh, checking to make sure that there's demand for this product, that type of thing. Design the architecture, do the software development, and then we do the testing. So you see it's in phase five at the very end. So there can be months, you know, six months between uh, the start and when you get to testing, 12 months maybe if it's a really large project or uh, poorly defined and there's a lot of time spent in in kind of this area um, by the time testing is involved um, it is honestly too late at that point in my opinion um, it says even today most teams feel like testing is the last step in the development cycle it's true i'm <laughs> just this is, in my experience, this is very true. So what shift left does is, uh, you know, we have the right side of the software development li uh, life cycle. It wants to move that le uh, left, yeah. Bringing testing at the very end gives rise to many problems, such as a delay in release cycles, low quality product products, and increased development and testing costs. And they'll talk about this a little bit later in the article. So shift left pushes testing to the left or to the earlier stages in the pipeline enables teams to find and resolve bugs as early as possible in the development process. So you see here, all the testing is focused late in the cycle. Um, shift left moves a lot of that focus to the left side. And uh, so the goal again is not only to increase collaboration between testers and developers, but makes identifying key aspects that need to be tested early in the development a whole lot easier. And that's where a lot of this work is going to be, not on doing tests necessarily, but identifying, okay, we're going to need this type of user, we're going to need this type of account, we're going to need access to the database so that we can set up this data so that we can use it for testing. Or the this is, these are the requirements that you want. Okay, how are we going to test these requirements? So a lot of the time spent here is just understanding how you're going to write your test and planning all that out. And uh, that's really beneficial because you don't want to write tests just for the sake of writing tests. I think that's a terrible idea. It creates a ton of uh, maintenance cost if you have a bunch of tests that aren't actually doing anything. Um, so, you know, if you get to here and you want to, normally you'd get to here and say you're a tester and say, okay, I need to get this account set up so that I can run this test. Well, the development and the design has already been done. So if there's a if it's very difficult to get that account set up for whatever reason uh, because of a design choice, then it's going to make your testing difficult. Whereas here, if we say, OK, I'm going to need an account set up for this so I can run my test, the, the, the architecture team can go, OK, well, we know we know when making this architecture that our testers are going to need accounts so they can uh, run their tests. So let's design the architecture in a way that allows for that. So it really saves you a lot of time. And that's kind of the goal of it. So let's talk about the benefits of shift left testing. Increased delivery speed uh, basically says that the sooner the start, the sooner you finish. And this goes back to being able to have your test uh, and your test data ready to go. You can test quicker. This helps in significantly reducing the time between releases. And with that, it increases the delivery speed, which is great. 
enhanced test coverage. Basically, the more time you have to write tests, the more tests you're going to write that cover the code that you need. You can also better plan out what uh, tests are going to need to be written so you can have a better understanding there. A more streamlined workflow. So one thing I thought was really important that they said is that shifting left is hard to implement, but worth the time and effort. It is hard to implement because you have to get a lot. It's it's not because it's technically difficult, but because it's uh, you have to get a lot of people involved. You have to convince your project manager to or your product manager to include you in these planning sessions. You have to convince architecture to include you in the session. So there's a lot of um, non-technical parts that go into shifting left. And you do have to convince a lot of people to take on this new responsibility and including you. And they might not be used to it because they're used to the previous way of doing software development where testing is always at the end. And why does testing need to be involved at the beginning? They're not architecture. So why would I want my QA people to be deciding the architecture for me? I don't want that. That's the architecture job's responsibility, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, to mention that. It does also mention that it helps the testing team, testing team get more comfortable with the tools and technology concerns. So they'll have a better understanding of what's coming down the pipeline when it gets to uh, their desk for them to test. Testing early facilitates a stronger bond between business requirements and quality assurance scripts, motivating the team to automate more test scripts as part of the requirements gathering process. It's a really good point. It helps build a better connection between the QA team and the rest of the software development team. And that's really important because as a QA team, you don't want the rest of the team just throwing things over the wall to you and saying, here, here's the product, go test it, have fun. Tell us that there's nothing broken because we have to release this in a couple of weeks. And if you tell us that something is broken, that's really bad uh, because that's going to delay the release. And also, if you tell us that nothing is broken and there is something broken, we're going to be really mad at you because you let us release this when it was clearly not tested. So that's a really bad model to go after. So this is part of moving things shift left, get you more involved, get the developers to know who your QA team is and uh, develop a stronger bond. Yeah. Reduce development and testing cost. The sooner you find your mistakes, the easier they will be resolved. That's pretty true. Uh, because mistakes grow bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. So if there's a mistake that happens early on in the software process and nobody catches it until at the very end, a lot of code gets written around that mistake. And when you go to fix that one piece of code, you end up having to fix a lot more just because so much has been built around it. Uh, compared to um, getting involved, catching that mistake right away, then not a lot of code has been written around the mistake, so it's really easy to fix. Uh, they go through an example. We'll skip through that. Cost of fixing bugs. We all know that that it's really costly to fix bugs, especially once it gets to production. That kind of thing. Uh, improves product quality by facilitating facilitating timely correspondence between stakeholders, developers, testlers, time testlers, testers, and timely feedback, which helps improve the code quality. Again getting involved with the team, having your QA team uh, and your stakeholders and your developers all be one big team instead of these separate silos really, really does improve that team dynamic. So what are some of the best practices for shift left testing? Well, proper planning, this goes into it. Developers and testers should plan how to shape coding and testing as early as possible in the development cycle. This again goes back to as a tester, I'm going to need this data. I'm going to need these accounts. These are the type of things I'm going to be testing for. Basically, let the development team know what you're going to be working on. And it gives you a clue into really thinking ahead of time while things can still be changed, uh, what you're going to be testing, what's important to focus on. Uh, complete understanding of product requirements. That's a really good point. I don't know why I didn't really highlight it, but basically as a tester, you get a better understanding of, okay, what are the key pieces of functionality that need to be tested here versus what can I, you know, what's not super important that I can run a few tests on, but if it breaks, it's not the end of the world. Honestly, there are going to be times when something breaks and it's just not the end of the world, uh, but there are going to be times when something breaks and it is not good. So uh, as a QA person, you need to know 
or it's really helpful to know the difference so you can focus your efforts on protecting the really important stuff. Specify quality standards. As developers are not trained in testing from the ground level, QA managers should outline the quality standards so that the developers who are running tests have clarity on the type of bugs to look for. So basically we're helping promote the QA mindset. Um, and so, you know, when I first started out as a developer, I loved having a QA uh, guy right behind me when we were in cubicles because he would just say, I would say, hey, this is ready for testing. 10 minutes later, he'd say, oh, I found a bug. And I'd go, what? How did you already find a bug? Yeah, it was this right here. And I'd go, oh my gosh, I didn't even think to test that. That makes perfect sense. So it really helped me develop a, a mindset of what to watch out for. That way, next time before I send it over to him, I would look at it and go, okay, I need to check for this real quick and make sure that uh, that's it's tested because I don't want to have him uh, return my code in 10 minutes. That's uh, not something that I want to keep going. So. Uh, one other part of shift left testing is embracing test automation. The development team should lever, lever, leverage test automation as shift left testing involves frequent testing. So you're not going to be able to do this uh, from a manual standpoint because it's just too much testing to do over the entire life cycle. Uh, one thing I do want to say about this is it might be difficult to get test automation in place or or to start writing a lot of uh, automated scripts because the product is going to change quite a bit as it's being developed. This is especially true for something like the HTML of the page. We use selectors when we write uh, automation to select different HTML elements. And as those selectors change, you're going to end up having to rewrite your test or redo how it's done. So what you want, what I would say at the beginning, you really want to focus your time less on writing um, tests or automated tests and more on writing the automation that allows you to get the data set up in the way that you need. So this is something like writing scripts that create accounts that have different types of uh, user settings and stuff like this, or uh, different products if you're doing some sort of e-commerce thing. Um, basically do a lot of automation that isn't necessarily a, a standard test, but will allow you to write a lot of tests and have them be really good tests that are uh, not breaking all the time because the test account got deleted for whatever reason. Um, yeah, focus on that at the beginning. Automation drives shift left testing in a big way and ensures minimal bugs are found later on in the software development lifecycle. And that's actually a good point. Uh, once you write or once you do write uh, automated test at the beginning, you can just reuse it again and again, assuming the HTML doesn't change or the, the whole design doesn't change, which it's going to. So I think one big thing that uh, probably isn't covered to or that I didn't see covered in this article are the drawbacks of this approach. One of that, one of those drawbacks is um, you might write some automation that just stops working, and you might you're going to spend a fair amount of time updating your automation just because the design changed. And again, this comes back to getting to work with that development team really closely and have a better sense for what's coming down the pipeline and go, okay, the development team is going to rework this feature. Um, here's how that's going to impact automation. And so your project manager knows, or even your developer knows when they submit this pull request and it goes through the CI CD pipeline, it's going to fail because the automation hasn't been updated. And maybe you could even say, hey, here's where the automation needs to be updated. We need to update this selector from using this ID to using this class and the automation works. And they can actually put that as part of their pull request so that it still passes. So just kind of meshes the two teams together. It makes sense to have a tester work on a feature from the very beginning, and they should get involved in all the project meetings, right from the requirement gathering meetings to the review code meetings. I really agree with that. Testers should be involved throughout the life cycle because they're an important part of the team. They really are. They are the final thing that's keeping a really bad bug from getting released to production. And if you don't have them incorporated, you're going to end up with um tests that are not useful because the QA member doesn't have the data that they need because they don't know how to ask for it. The Q 
QA member doesn't know the specific requirements because they never were part of those meetings. So they don't know what's important or they don't really, they didn't get like a, a spec document, things like that. Um, just this huge disconnect that basically the QA member is going to write a lot of tests, but the developer isn't ever going to run those tests. So the tests are always going to be failing because every time the developer makes a change, they inadvertently break the test because of a selector change or something. And then the QA member is always having to play catch up and never actually gets to run the test for real in the full life cycle. It's never in, in, incorporated into the CI CD pipeline because the test would always fail and they were tired of these failing tests getting in the way. It just, it's a big mess when they're not working cohesively together. And the idea of shift left testing is to get them working together. They talk about the agile testing pyramid here. I'm just going to skip kind of over that. And then they get to the conclusion and uh, kind of reaffirm a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about. So that's the article. I'll link, I will leave a link to it in the description below. And um, I would really love to hear your feedback on this format. This is something that I've been trying to figure out how to get more content on this channel without it taking up all my time. It takes a lot of time to do the research for it, the editing, that type of stuff, uh, and the recording. You probably heard my son uh, yelling at his friends in the background because he's playing online. But um, what I really like about this for me is that it's... Um, pretty simple. I just read an article, highlight my import, my favorite parts and just read it out and share it with you. And it's a lot easier than trying to type this up in a blog post. So uh, anyway, I'd love to hear your feedback if you like this or if it's just not something that fits for what you're looking for as far as videos good. Videos good. Vide vi videos go. Anyway, until next time, have fun testing.